I have a pretty interesting tale about a Ouija board. This was about 10 years ago. I was 20 and my brother Keenan was 26. Our grandfather on our dad's side died. And since my dad was distracted by that, Keenan and I decided we'd get granddad's affairs sorted. That started with going to his house and sifting through what we thought dad would want to keep and what was okay to toss or donate. We made it through the kitchen, the bedroom, and we're just about done with the living room. So far, we'd found nothing that was really worth holding on to except for an old photo album that had the original photos of Grandma and Grandpa's wedding and the subsequent honeymoon. While we were flipping through the photos and poking fun at the questionable fashion choices, there was a loud crash from the attic. Keenan and I just stared at each other, our inner dialogue probably saying, Well, I'm not going up there. You have to go up there. We actually had a pretty dramatic argument, and decided that since I was younger and had more life to live, Keenan would check it out in case there was an axe murderer up there waiting for us. Of course, there wasn't, and he actually convinced me to go up there with him when he called down, Darius, you gotta come see this. Keenan was pretty good at pulling practical jokes and pranks, but this wasn't a joke. I poked my head up, my feet still on the ladder, and saw that he was holding a Ouija board. Absolutely not, I said, then started back down the ladder. Keenan was a lot more open-minded than I was. I was under the belief that if you don't fuck with things you weren't supposed to, you won't get fucked with. That goes for things like Ouija boards, rituals like Bloody Mary, haunted locations, or anything that was said to be connected to the afterlife. I went back to the living room, but could hear Keenan coming from down the creaky old ladder saying, You're being dramatic. I didn't want to use it. I just wanted to show you. He was in front of me now, the Ouija board tucked under his arm. I shot him a dirty look and said, You better leave that thing here, or toss it in a fire. He laughed at me, but I was serious, and I let him know I was. When it was time to leave, he was the first to go. He had a wife and a new baby to take care of, while I was single and still living in an apartment. I had a little extra free time. I spent that time tidying up the house before heading out myself. Back home, I went into my trunk to get my bags out, and there it was. A damn Ouija board with a little post-it note that said, With love, and was signed by Keenan. I slammed the trunk shut, decided I'd deal with it and Keenan in the morning, and just went inside to shower and go to bed. It had been a long day. That morning, I went downstairs to start my coffee, but stopped in my tracks when I saw that damn Ouija board sitting on my coffee table. It was square in the middle, with the planchette resting on top. There was no sticky note this time, but that didn't mean Keenan put it there. He had a key to my place in case of emergency, so I don't put this above him. Also, I never locked my car, so getting it out would have been a breeze. Still, though, Driving all the way out there to further this prank would have been extreme. I told myself I'd throw it out once I had some coffee and woke up some more, but when I was in the kitchen, I heard something scraping over something in the living room. It was loud enough to be heard over the gurgling of the coffee pot, and the best way I can describe it would be the sound a large dresser would make when going across a hardwood floor. It wasn't nearly that loud exactly, but it was definitely wood on wood. I guess now would be a good time to explain what the board looked like. It wasn't one of those you'd see beside board games nowadays, with the cardboard Ouija board and the plastic planchette. This one was carved, most likely by hand, from one solid piece of wood. I don't know much about wood, but it was very light red. From some research, I would guess it was likely a red sanders tree. The planchette was much darker, but still red. It could have been stained. The small opening near the top of it was glass, not plastic. In all seriousness, it was a beautiful thing to look at. I just didn't want it in my home. The grinding had come to a stop by this point, and I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. Slowly, I made my way back into the living room, and the planchette had moved. Now, I was willing to believe Keenan had moved this thing into my house last night, but there was no way he'd stay here overnight or snuck in this morning just to move this thing. I knew there was something off about it the moment he brought it down from the attic. 
I walked over to it, and instead of the planchette resting in the middle like it was this morning, it had moved over to the small hello in the top left of the board. I felt frozen in that moment, afraid to move. I was worried if I said or did anything, it would start moving again, and I didn't think I could handle that. I called Keenan, fully intent on yelling at him for bringing this thing into my house, but when he answered, all my animosity went out the window. Keenan was audibly upset and distraught. Darius, I was just about to call you, man. Listen, we need to get rid of that fucking board as soon as we can. I, I'm sorry I put it in your car, but you have to get rid of it. Keenan went on to explain that he'd had a horrible nightmare last night. In this nightmare, he saw Grandad take his own life over and over again in various different ways. It just never stopped, he said. I woke up sweating and crying. I got into the shower to try and clear my head, but no matter how cold I set the water, it was burning my back. I got Malik to look at it and... Just look. I'll send you a picture. I pulled up the picture on my phone and wanted to cry. Keenan's back was riddled with thin scratches from top to bottom. Some of them had small dots of blood coming from them. I'm heading to the ER to get them checked out and make sure I don't have any weird disease, but I need you to destroy that board. He was serious. This wasn't an elaborate joke. Without thinking, I snatched up the board, threw it in the fire pit, poured lighter fluid all over it, and set it ablaze. The smoke was thick and black, and the smell was foul. After a few hours and a long talk with my landlord about when it's appropriate to have a fire in the backyard, the board was finally gone. I spoke with Keenan sometime later and he explained everything. Apparently the Ouija board wasn't just lying around in the attic like I'd initially thought. It had been locked away in a box with other equally questionable things. Turned out, Grandad used to be into some strange things when he was younger and had locked it all away for a reason. Keenan is better now. The scratches never really got a medical explanation, but I don't think either of us expected that, and they cleared up after a few weeks. Luckily, I never had anything like that happen to me. The other things in the box were disposed of the same way the board was, and neither I, Keenan, or his husband Malik told anyone in the family about it. It wasn't the right time, given we just lost Grandad, and honestly, I don't think the right time will ever come. It's nice to get it out there, though. The picture is long gone now, so please don't ask for it. Ever since I was a kid, I loved being outside at night. It didn't matter if it was summertime or wintertime. I loved being out in the dark when everything was quiet. It was therapeutic for me. I could get away from the stress of everyday life, like grades, school, my parents. It continued on when I got older, too. As a teenager, I'd walk around outside my yard anywhere from 12 to 4 a.m. My parents weren't too mad about it, seeing as we lived in a pretty safe neighborhood, and our backyard was fenced in. I'd lay on our trampoline, looking out at the stars and listening to the subtle sounds of the insects and the occasional person coming home from a late night shift. When I was finally old enough to live alone, I broadened my horizons and started going on nightly walks. First it was just through the neighborhood, but eventually I started walking through a park not far from my house. It was a nice park. Not too big, but it did have a few trails that led through a forested area where only people and dogs were permitted, so you wouldn't have to worry about people with bikes staying on their side of the path. Sorry to any bikers out there, but y'all do get in the way. I was on one of these late night walks on those trails that I saw something that has kept me off of them since. I was already pretty tired from a long day at work, but winding down with a walk sounded perfect. I threw on my walking shoes and headed out. Around halfway down the trail, I noticed how quiet the forest was. Of course it was late, but that never stopped the nocturnal animals from making noise. In the few times I'd done this before, I'd heard owls, some deers, maybe a fox once or twice, but now... 
It was strange. It felt wrong, for lack of a better word. I decided it was best for me to just head back home and go to bed. I was tired anyway, and I had the day off the next day, so I could even sleep in. With me promising myself I would do just that, I turned to go back to the trailhead, but stopped. Something was standing in the middle of the trail. At the time, I thought I knew what it was. It looked like a deer, though it was a big one, just standing there, staring at me as if trying to figure out what it wanted to do. I had a headlamp on to light the way, but it was sent to the lowest possible setting. I only needed a few feet in front of me, and I didn't want to bother the wildlife that was out there, but I thought if I turned up the light, maybe this thing would get spooked and run off. I reached up, turned the dial two notches. The light was focused on the deer now, and I could make out more of its features. This is where the story gets a bit gross, so if you're sensitive to animals being hurt, you may want to stop reading, but I'll try to keep it brief. The deer was missing one of its eyes, and the other one was hanging from its socket. The nose was completely gone, torn off and showing the bone, and there was no bottom jaw to speak of. There was blood and drool dripping from the deer's tongue. I fought the urge to vomit as I looked at its hooves and realized the only reason I thought it was so big at first is because it was being held off the ground by something behind it. I wasn't able to get a great look at it, but from what I saw it was at least six to seven feet tall. It stood on hind legs but was hunching over to avoid the branches above it. The best uh, approximation I can give was if a Great Dane were to stand straight up, but also hunch and hold the deer in its mouth eyes caught the light from my headlamp for a half second and glowed red. I hauled ass. Through absolute luck, I made it out of the forested area and back to the park without tripping or breaking an ankle, but once I was out, I didn't stop until I was underneath a street light and felt close enough to civilization that someone would hear me if I screamed. I must have scanned that tree line for 20 minutes, trying to make sure that the thing didn't follow me out. I eventually made it home, tried to do some research into what could be in the area, and the best candidate I could find would be a bear, but a very sick one. One that had lost most, if not all, of its fur, and was running around trying to find something more tasty than a few berries. Apparently bears do eat deer, especially in the summer when this took place, so I've been telling myself for years that's what I saw. That's what I told the city official and local wildlife authorities also. A search was done of the wooded area, but they found nothing. No dead deer, no malnourished bears, just the regular animals you'd expect. They did end up fencing off the woods to locals, but kept most of the trails open. I know I probably sound insane, and believe me, I wish I was, but I know what I saw that night, and I won't be walking at night anymore. I tell this one a lot, but I've only ever had a handful of people believe me. There's going to be talk of addiction and heavy drug use, so I'd skip this if you're sensitive to that. I used to break into houses fairly regularly. I was in my early 20s, strung out on some serious shit, living with eight other people in my same situation, and wanted money. Easiest thing to do, seeing as I couldn't hold a job longer than a week, was to steal money or jewelry and sell it to my local pawn shop to score a few hundred bucks. The owner of the pawn shop, Barry, definitely had his suspicions about me and my friend, but he never asked questions. Besides, the police in town were about as useful as a spoon in a sinking ship. One particular night, I believe it was a Friday, I'd been without a good high in three days and was getting incredibly desperate. A lot of the houses in my general vicinity had gotten smart about my friends and I. Many had brought home a dog recently, put up some cameras, other just bought motion sensor floodlights. All were great ways to ensure no one was ever going to try and break into your house. And then I got word of a house at the dead end of a road that was recently foreclosed on. It was about five miles from where I was staying, but I had a bike, so the trip wouldn't have been that unbearable. And as I've said, I probably would have walked round-trip distance twice if it meant that I could get high. 
I rolled up to the house and dropped my bike in the driveway. The tip was spot on. There was a paper sign on the door explaining that since the tenant had failed to pay their mortgage, the house was now under ownership of the bank and would soon be up for auction as is. That was exciting, as it meant everything would have been left behind. Obviously, big things like TVs and game consoles, the biggest at the time being an Xbox, would be out of the question for me on my bike, but I hoped I could score a few jewelry boxes and some smaller electronics. I picked the lock and stepped in, closing the door behind me. I knew that the lock to the house was put there by the city, so I had no more than three to four minutes before the boys in blue came bursting through the door looking for me. I knew immediately this was an older person's home. There was plastic covering the furniture, and the house had that familiar old person smell that we all know. With that in mind, I skipped over the living room, as it was unlikely this person had a gaming console, and headed straight to the bedroom. I was much luckier there. On top of an incredibly ornate and admittedly beautiful dresser sat three different jewelry boxes. I looked at the first two and saw diamond rings, earrings, pearls, the works. Whoever lived here loved to go out and look good while doing it. It was as I was tossing the second box into my bag that I heard the squeak of a door opening behind me. Out of pure instinct, I dropped everything and threw my hands up. While the police were useless, as I said before, they were more likely to kill someone than they were to bring you in for questioning. It's easier that way, I guess. But luckily for me, it wasn't the police. Though I'm now wishing it was. The bedroom door wasn't the one that was creaking open. It was the closet door. As it reached the halfway point, a hand came around the side. It had been pretty dark in there, but I was able to make out the hand as it was incredibly pale and contrasted heavily on the dark stain of the door. It was an older woman's hand fingers were long and bony. The nails were long and painted a deep red. As more of the hand and then arm came out, I said, I'm leaving right now. I'm dropping everything and leaving. And I had every intention to. I left my bag on the floor and started toward the bedroom door, but now there was a little old lady standing in front of it. She was small, no taller than 5'3", and she wore a light green nightgown, had very little hair, and her nails were painted red. Was this the same woman from the closet? I thought. It couldn't be. How'd she move that quickly? I spoke again. Ma'am, I'm leaving. I don't have anything of yours. I left it in the bag. I didn't think that anyone lived here, and I'm just trying to make some money. The woman's sweet face turned sour, and she made her way over to me very slowly. She looked as if she was barely holding on, and again I found myself asking how she made it to the door that fast if she could barely move now. Looking up at me, she held a long, skinny finger and said, Don't. Come back. I pushed past her, ran through the house, hopped on my bike, and hauled ass back to where I was staying. Once I was back, there were only about three to four people there. I was so freaked out and trying to explain to them what happened, but they were too blasted to even know I was in the room. I ended up sleeping under an overpass that night. Around a week later, I found out why the house was really foreclosed on. Yes, the woman who lived there hadn't paid for a few months, but it was because she was recovering from breast cancer. She didn't have any extended family, and her husband had passed just a few years before the house was foreclosed. Apparently, when she had come back in for a routine checkup, the cancer had returned, and it was far worse. She took her own life when she got back home. I used the library computers to look up her name and found out that she'd hung herself in the closet. The same one I saw her walk out of. I can see why no one believes me, but I'll never forget that little old lady or her house. As for me, I'm doing much better. Not long after that experience, I started to take a step back and really think about what I was doing, how it affected people I targeted, how it affected me. I was on the brink of death, at some point doing the bare minimum to get by. Using the last bit of money I had, I reached out to a family member and poured my heart out. 
They said I could live with them as long as I stayed sober and went to rehab. It's been well over 12 years and I haven't looked back. I think about that old woman a lot whenever someone asks about ghost stories. And I tell them this one. It's always met with, you probably hallucinated or you were having a bad trip and don't remember it right. <laughs> yeah, I wish that were true. I've been an avid camper since I was a kid. My dad would always take my mom and I on hikes through national parks to the camping grounds and we'd spend two to three days out there. A lot of kids at school didn't get the appeal, but it was something that I fell in love with on our first trip out. Our trips became annual. We planned work and school schedules to make sure we could get at least two days of a trip or it wasn't worth it. We were a camping family. But of course, as I got older, so did my parents, and soon they weren't able to go out as often as we usually did. That's when I got the idea of going out on my own for the first time. This was last year, 2021, so COVID was of course a thing, but a lot of national parks had their camping sites open since, well, they were in the middle of the woods. I reserved a spot online and headed out. It was sometime in mid-July, way past the 4th. The trails to the site were pretty quiet. It was a new park, so I had no idea what to expect, but the scenery was just incredible. There were countless streams, towering rock faces, and even a few waterfalls. I made sure to take plenty of photos for my parents, but halfway down the trail, I found myself completely entranced. I couldn't even think about looking at all of that through the lens of a camera, so I opted to just sit for a few minutes on the bank of a large river. I was so focused on the water, I hadn't even realized that it was no longer making noise. I shook my head a bit to try and shake myself from daydreaming, thinking that I had somehow zoned it all out, but after a few seconds of hearing nothing, I became worried. I called out, hello, but I couldn't hear it. Even more scared now, I kept yelling out to anyone who was near me, hoping that they would hear me. Eventually, someone came from behind and grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me. You okay, buddy? It was an older man, dressed like he was maybe working for the park. I, I wanted to hug him, kiss him on the face, just because I was ecstatic about hearing again, but I held back and just said, Yeah, I think I just got a little lost while coming to the river. Can you point me to Campsite 3? He pointed me in the general direction and said, Just look for the markings on the tree. I'll take you straight to it. You want me to come with you? I politely declined and went about my way, still thinking about what had just happened. In all my years of camping, nothing like that had ever taken place. I made it to the campsite without another incident and set up quickly. It was already beginning to get dark, so I set up a fire and started cooking shortly after. After dinner, I put out the fire and went to my small tent for some reading by headlamp when I noticed it. The sounds were gone again. I sat up in my sleeping bag to make sure. I really focused in, trying to listen for anything. An owl, deer, hell. I'd take a complete stranger at that point. But there was nothing. I made my way out of the sleeping bag and unzipped the tent slowly, though it felt pointless because I wasn't even sure if anyone would have heard it. Outside the tent, the humidity and heat really hit me. I was surprised by how much better it felt in the tent, and I was tempted to just go back inside and wait out this bizarre situation, but something in me said I needed to know. Outside the tent now, I turned up the intensity on my headlamp and scanned the tree line. I almost didn't see it at first. It blended in so well with the trees that I'm still not sure I was hallucinating or dreaming. It was tall, maybe six or seven feet high, and wore a blank expression. It seems silly now, but all I could think about was Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy. It blended in with everything around it, so even with the headlamp, I had a hard time focusing. It looked to be covered in tree bark 
and moss, maybe even vines, but in some spots where the covering was thinner, I could see a bright white skin underneath. That's when it occurred to me that maybe this was actually a person, someone who'd gotten lost and needed help. Maybe they were covered in all that because they'd fallen down a steep hill. I called out to it, and it seemed to perk up for a second, but when I stepped forward, it bolted in the opposite direction. I'd never seen anything move as quickly as that thing did. Sound returned to the forest soon after its departure as well. Shaken, but not willing to pack up and leave in the middle of the night, I crawled back into my tent and forced my eyes shut until I finally fell asleep. The following morning, I was out of the park before the receptionist was in. I told my parents about it that day as well. And while they claimed to have never seen anything like it, they also made me promise I'd never go back to that state park again. I assured them I wouldn't, and I meant it. I don't know what the hell that thing was, but I'd be glad if I never saw it again. This happened to me about two years ago while I was babysitting my best friend's kid. My friend had a pretty important meeting that morning and couldn't find a sitter that would be able to make it there in the time that she needed, so I offered. I made it to the house at 8am, got the little guy out of bed, made sure he brushed his teeth and then started getting his breakfast ready. It was Saturday, so there was no real rush to get him out of his pajamas even though his mom was a bit of a prude, I let him watch cartoons while I cooked. While I finished up the eggs, I heard him talking in the living room. That wasn't anything new. A lot of the shows he watched were in the vein of Dora the Explorer or Blue's Clues, shows that called for interaction from the kid watching. As I listened in, though, I noticed he wasn't responding to the bubbly personality on the screen. Rather, he was responding to... himself? Again, I didn't think too much of it as kids talk to themselves all the time, but when I went to get him for breakfast, he wasn't even watching TV. He was sitting in the corner, just staring at the wall, talking up a storm. And he seemed annoyed. Parker, what's what's wrong, bud? Who are you talking to? He spun around, startled. The tiredness in his eyes was all but gone now. No one? He said sheepishly. You're not in trouble, buddy. I tried to reassure him. I just thought there was someone else in the house, and I wanted to make sure you were safe. He just nodded and made his way back to the kitchen, whispering a small thank you as he went. I stood there for a moment, just staring at the corner as if something was going to come out of the wall and say, Sorry about that, that was me talking to the kid. Luckily, nothing did, and I went to sit at the table with Parker, hoping I could pull something out of him. How'd you sleep last night, Parker? Not too bad. He was only eight, but he spoke like a right gentleman. It was cute. I did have a bad dream, though. It's the one I've had before. I found myself holding my coffee just under my nose, not to take in the aroma, but because I felt like I needed to hide from him. I wasn't a parent, never really wanted to be one, so I tended to get defensive in situations like this. I didn't want to say the wrong thing and have Parker tell his mom I'm a terrible babysitter. I pushed for more details. Do you mind telling me about it? He pushed down an exaggerated sigh and explained. It starts with me waking up in my bed, but my room looks different. My floors are wood and my bed squeaks when I get up. I walk over to play with my toys, but they aren't there. They're old toys. They're all made of wood or metal and aren't very fun. After that, my bedroom door opens, but it isn't my bedroom door. The glow and the dark stars are gone. It's just plain. It squeaks just like the bed does. I look at the doorway, and there's a big man standing there. He isn't fat, though. He's just really tall. Reminds me of a strong man from the circus. He never talks to me, but I get up and walk over to him. He takes my hand and walks me out of the bedroom. In the hallway, I see a reflection in the mirror, but I don't see me. I see another kid. Someone I don't know. I can't see the man's face. He's too tall. He takes me, or the kid, I guess, 
outside to his truck. He makes the kid get in the back of his truck and tells him to wrap him in a blanket. It's really cold and the blanket doesn't help. The ride lasts for a long time. When the truck stops, I hear the man get out and open the truck door on the back. I can't move now. Too cold. He carries me for a while before dropping me on the ground. My arms start digging. And I wake up. I... I wanted to cry. I felt so bad for this kid. That dream was way too vivid and way too dark for him to come up with on the spot. Not only that, but I think I knew what question I had to ask next. Do you think the person you've been talking to in the living room is the boy from your dreams? He nodded, then asked if he could go back out and watch cartoons. I told him that was fine and started cleaning up. I wasn't sure what to do at that point. I felt like I was living in a shitty horror movie. I shot a text to his mom letting her know that I wanted to talk to her about Parker and that it was nothing too serious, but it was really important. That night, Parker's mom and I spoke for about three hours about what we should do. We talked about therapy, mostly, but she was pretty nervous about that. Parker had trouble opening up to new people, and she wasn't even sure if she could afford it. We finally decided to just give him a few days and see if things got worse. She asked me to stay over for those days, just so she'd have someone else there with her in case things got worse. I agreed. And I'm glad I did. Monday night, two days after Parker told me about his nightmare, he woke up the whole house by screaming out from his room. His mom and I both ran in, her scooping him up and me sitting beside them for moral support. I didn't want to intrude too much until I saw it. There was a little boy in the corner of his room. A little boy who was a deep shade of blue with dark lips and dirt in his hair and mud on his shoes. Sarah, we need to leave. I barely spoke over a whisper, but she heard me and didn't argue. We grabbed a few changes of clothes, wrapped up Parker, and headed out for a hotel that night. Sarah and I spoke for a few more hours that night, and I explained what Parker had told me on Saturday and what I saw that night. After much deliberation, it was decided that they'd come stay with me and put that house up for sale. Neither of us were big believers in the paranormal, but there were far too many coincidences. Not only that, but my house was only about a 15-minute drive from Sarah's job, and Parker wouldn't have to change schools. As I said at the top, this was two years ago. Sarah and I are now engaged, and Parker has been doing much better. The house was eventually sold to an older gentleman and his wife, and I hope they have a better time in there than Parker and Sarah did. As I said in the title, I've been dealing with some weird shit lately, and I can't really think of anyone to go to other than the internet. My friends and family don't believe in this stuff, and I'm not to the point of hiring a stranger to come investigate my home. That's silly. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for everything here. I just need someone to actually see this post before it's taken down. This started two weeks ago, in my bedroom. A few times throughout the night, I'd wake up freezing. Turns out my blanket had fallen off the bed. I'll admit that I do roll over a lot when I sleep, but never so much to throw my blanket off of myself. This kept happening for about three nights, so I decided to film myself sleeping to see if my rolling around was really causing the blanket to fall from the bed. It wasn't. For the three nights that I filmed, somewhere around three in the morning, my blanket would simply slide off the bed. It was like someone was taking it off to wash it, but I never saw anyone. A few minutes after it hit the floor, I'd wake up freezing. Some people have asked for a more clear time frame, so I'll just say that this did start around November, so yes, it just could be cold in my house, but I keep the heat pretty much on all night. I shouldn't wake up freezing. A few more days passed, and more things began to happen. 
On nights that I didn't wake up freezing, I'd have terrible nightmares that left me groggy every morning before work. I decided I'd give coffee a try. I was never a big fan of it, but I figured with enough cream and sugar, anything can taste good. The first morning I made it, my cup moved behind my back. I know that sounds insane, and I think this is where I normally lose people, but hear me out. I would place the mug down beside the coffee pot, then turn around to grab the sugar and cream from the fridge. When I would turn back around, the mug wouldn't be on the counter with the coffee pot, but rather on the island in the middle of the kitchen. And for the sake of getting asked this 100 times, yes, I live alone. There was no one over to visit, and no one else in the house. I've been alone while all of this has been happening. That's why I'm so freaked out. The teleporting mug and the blankets being taken off me in the middle of the night have been fairly constant over these two weeks, but there's something new that I'm experiencing. Well, it's a little scarier than the other things. A few days ago, I woke with my back right shoulder blade feeling incredibly sore. My first thought was that I just slept on it wrong or pulled a muscle, but when I went to apply Icy Hunt to it, I noticed it was raised. There was a welt on my back. I grabbed a mirror and ran to the bathroom to look at it. I wish I could show you all, but every time I try to upload it, something goes wrong or the photo gets corrupted. So I'll do my best to explain it. In the simplest terms, it's a hand, but a rather big one. It's bright red, like a sunburn, but not hot to the touch. Its middle finger barely crests over my shoulder, and the bottom of the palm is just slightly below my actual shoulder blade. In an attempt to stop any other questions, I'm expecting, yes, I've been to the doctor. Well, more specifically, the emergency room. I was too freaked out about it to book an appointment and wait. The doctor told me it was likely eczema or a similar skin rash, prescribed an ointment, and sent me on my way. When I asked him why it was shaped like a giant hand, he just laughed, told me I was seeing things. It's also worth noting that it's not itchy, either. I'm afraid that there's something going on in my house, and it's made even worse by the fact that no one believes me. If you read this post before it's likely taken down, and think you know what it is or how to stop it, please reach out to me. I'm scared. Since I was old enough to understand what ghosts were and old enough to watch Ghost Hunters, I told my parents I wanted to do that for a living. As an adult, I understand how ridiculous that dream was. I'm not even sure being a professional ghost hunter is a thing, but that didn't stop me from asking for ghost hunting kits every year for my birthday until I was 16. That was the year my parents caved. They told me that I could have it as long as I was safe and didn't do anything stupid. Basically, don't break into any abandoned buildings or asylums looking for ghosts because I'll more than likely find a trespassing charge rather than the paranormal. I understood where they were coming from, so I looked up a few haunted locations in my area. A few were old bridges that were way too dangerous to cross, or places that were long abandoned and forgotten to time that were fenced off. It took a few hours, but I finally ran across something that was safe to visit and wouldn't get me in trouble. At least I hoped. It was a cemetery, about a mile from my house. I won't share the location of the cemetery because while the story takes place nearly 30 years ago, the cemetery is now a protected historical landmark, and I don't want this comment held against me if someone tries something stupid. I set out one night with a friend, assuring my parents we'd be safe and we wouldn't get into any trouble. The cemetery was creepy enough during the day, but at night, it was something completely different. Some of the headstones were falling over due to age, some were completely split. There were even some large tombs that had been erected some hundred years ago. We walked the perimeter, doing an EMF sweep, but nothing came up. We then decided to try out that digital voice recorder and see if we could speak to anyone. 
I suggested we do a blast session. It's a silly ghost hunting term that means we'd ask a question, wait about a minute or 30 seconds, and listen back to see if anything spoke back. It was a good way to communicate with whatever may be out there. For clarity, I'll format this next part like a conversation because there was definitely someone there. Austin started with a simple, Is anyone here with us tonight? We sat across from each other, legs crossed, and about a foot from the closest headstone, one that was incredibly weathered and on the verge of falling over. I stopped the recording and played it back. We heard Austin ask his question through the tiny, crackly speaker and then listened harder for a response. Yes. It was faint, nearly a whisper, but we knew what it was the moment we heard it. We must have played it back five or six times before we tried again with the same tactic. This time I asked the question, how old were you when you died? It was a pretty brutal question in retrospect, but I was 16 and stupid. We ran the recording back and heard the same voice only seconds after mine say, 72. It was clearer this time, and it sounded closer. I knew what we had to do next. One thing the ghost hunting kit didn't come with was a night vision camera. I assumed that was because they're much more expensive than a recorder and a plastic box with some LEDs on it. Luckily, my parents thought about that and were able to get one for me. It was the cheapest possible one at the time and could only record about 10 frames a second, literally, but it worked. I held it as steadily as I could and pointed it to Austin while he held out the EMF detector and the voice recorder. Then, he started asking questions and running the recording back periodically. Everything was quiet for a while, and we thought maybe what we'd heard was nothing more than our imagination. That was until I saw something on my camera. Austin, don't move, I said. There was a large mass of pure black only inches from his back, and it was towering over him, which wasn't an easy feat. Austin was the center for our school basketball team at the time, mostly because he was 6'3", but the shadow was well over that. Maybe even a full seven feet. There were no features, no arms or legs. It was just a blob. I'm not sure how much time passed before Austin responded to my warning of not moving, but when he did, all he said was, I can't. Watching the jumpy video from the camera, I saw this black blob slowly moving its way over top Austin. I could tell he was terrified, and I knew something was wrong, but I did the only logical thing I could think of in that situation. I threw the camera in my bag, snatched Austin by the arm, and yanked him toward me while yelling, Run! I'm not sure either of us had ever run that fast in our lives. We hopped on our bikes and pedaled until the cemetery was out of sight. Once we felt we were far enough away, we collapsed into a ditch just long enough to catch our breath. While lying there, I noticed Austin's breathing seemed off, so I shined my flashlight on him to make sure he was okay, and for the most part he was, but he was also crying. Anyone who grew up around the time that I did knows what this would usually lead to. Boys around that time were teased for showing emotion, but I could tell that he was really shook from the experience. I just told him I was sorry and gave him a hug. Shortly after, he calmed down and we made it back to my house in one piece. My dreams of being a ghost hunter were pretty much smashed that night. I never tried it again and probably never will. I still talk to Austin on a regular basis, and this story is one that comes up every year around Halloween. No one ever believes us, of course, but that's fine. We know what happened that night, and that's all that matters. My son told me about this thread because he knew I had quite the story. I'm new to Reddit and don't type on the computer often, so excuse any mistakes in my writing. This happened well over 30 years ago. I was in my early 20s and into my first real home. 
A well-off friend of mine's father was willing to rent it out for free for a month under the promise that I'd get a job in that time and start paying. It wasn't a bad deal, so I took it and started working as a bag boy at a mom and pop shop down the road. The store was only a 10 minute walk, and since I didn't have the money saved for a car, it made perfect sense for me. One lane street with no white lines on the sides or even reflectors. Pretty dangerous at night if you weren't careful. I didn't figure that out till much later. I'd say about three months after moving into the house. The bag boy job was going well, but when my boss asked if I could work nights putting things on shelves for a pay raise, I took it in an instant. I'd always been a night owl, and having the whole day to myself sounded like a dream. Furthermore, I'd spoken with some of the night crew before, and they seemed like really good people. At this time, I still didn't have my car, so walking was my only choice. Sure, it was a short walk, but with my shift starting at midnight, it was pitch black when I went to work now. With all trees on each side of the street, the moonlight barely peeked through. This was well before cell phones that have everything you need on them, including a flashlight, so I'd take my own actual flashlight to light the way. I wouldn't admit to anyone at the time, but I had started jogging down that road just to get off it faster. I always felt like there was something out there. A few weeks after starting the night job, I learned that there was something out there. It started like any other night. I walked to the house, my uniform on and flashlight ready. Just as I was out of the glow of my porch light, I turned it on and stopped. I just froze in the middle of the road. My flashlight caught something in its cone of light. I thought at first it was a man, granted one that needed a lot of help, much more than I could have offered, but as I looked on, I noticed it was far too lanky to be a person. I've known tall people all my life, but when someone walks on their hands and knees, their back end is always higher. Their legs are most likely longer than their arms. This wasn't the case with this thing. It was on all fours, but its back half was much lower to the ground, almost like a squat. It had large, bony hands placed down in front of it, fingers pointing out and its elbows pointed inward. Thin, gray, and white hairs hung from its pockmarked and oily head. Its mouth was wide open and far too big for its face, and a thick black tongue hung from it, dripping with saliva. I think I heard it breathing letting out gasping, raspy breaths. I wish I could say that I stood my ground and fought it off into the woods and brought it back to mount over the fireplace, but in reality, I did none of that. I ran back to my house, slammed the door, turned all the lights on, and called my boss to tell him I wasn't coming in unless he was willing to come get me. When he asked what was wrong, I thought about telling him what I'd seen, but decided it was best to go with a more logical explanation told him I'd seen a bobcat. Didn't feel too safe walking alone. He understood and came and got me. Work was a nice distraction for the rest of the night, but I still think about what the hell that thing was. To answer any questions before they're asked, no, I wasn't on anything, prescription or otherwise. Secondly, this happened in rural Georgia. I don't want to say too much about the location because I'm still fairly close to where it happened and Finally, no. I never saw it again, but I did hear something screaming out in the woods on a few occasions, and I know for certain it wasn't a bobcat. I've had a lot of people try to convince me that this was simply a case of sleep paralysis, but I've never believed it. There was definitely something else going on that night. I was about 15 or 16, and my parents had just moved us into a new house. It wasn't that old, maybe 20 or 30 years, but like a classic horror movie, the previous tenants had passed away in the house. My dad tried to convince my mom that it played no part in the house being sold well below market value, but we knew that's exactly what was happening. Either way, we were in a new house and were excited to get to know the new city, and I was ready to make some new friends since I had to switch schools. Everything was going wonderfully until about a month in. I started to have some pretty severe nightmares, which turned into night terrors. Three 
or four times a week, I'd have the same dream. I'd see myself lying in my bed before it would change to a first-person perspective of someone standing outside, looking at our house. I would hear heavy breathing, almost wheezing, as if the person breathing was asthmatic. Through this POV, the person would make their way into our house via kicking open the front door and go straight to the room I was sleeping in. But I wasn't the one in the bed, and the house looked a lot different. It was older. The person in my bedroom was an older gentleman. He must have been quite a heavy sleeper as he didn't wake up until this other man placed his hands around his throat. My nightmare would end just as the old man's eyes would go completely bloodshot and his face turn a deep blue. I'd wake up gasping for air, sweating profusely and screaming for my parents. This continued exactly like this for weeks. I was put into therapy, given sleeping medication, but nothing worked. It all came to a head the night after my 16th birthday. My parents tried to do something nice for me that day, but I was so perpetually tired that I could barely pay attention to anyone or anything. All I wished for that day was a decent night's sleep. Of course, that was too much to ask for. On our last night in that house, I fell asleep around 10 p.m. and awoke in the middle of the night, completely unable to move. I was lying on my back, moving my eyes around to look around the room, but my actual body couldn't move, not even my mouth. I would guess that only a few seconds passed before I heard our front door splinter and hit the wall behind it. I fought to move because I knew it was going to come, but I couldn't. I heard the heavy set man wheezing as he came down the hall into my room and stood over me for a moment before wrapping his giant hands around my neck. He squeezed, and I felt it. I swear I felt it. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I was fighting against everything to lift a single finger for what felt like hours before finally I shot up in my bed, sucked in as much air as I could, and started looking around the room for the large man. But he wasn't there. Second, I tried to call for my mom, but my throat was so sore I couldn't speak above a whisper. I ran into their room and woke them up, trying to explain what happened. It took a few minutes, but when they saw the redness and bruises developing on my neck, they told me to stop talking, and we rushed to the ER. No one believed me, as you would imagine, and... I was even put on watch for some time while my throat recovered. I was incredibly lucky that nothing fractured or was broken. I spoke with my parents over the few weeks I was in the hospital and, despite everything, convinced them I wouldn't be staying in that house until something was done. We weren't religious, but after speaking with a priest, they suggested getting the house cleansed. Once that was over, I moved back in after staying with my aunt for a few days. The nightmares stopped sometime after that, and I never had another episode of sleep paralysis. I say that knowing full well that wasn't what it was in the first place, because as I found out later, the previous tenant didn't just die in that house. He was murdered by the husband of the woman he was sleeping with. She'd been killed as well a few hours before the man made it to my house. 